And it will be a big revolution to bring companies and governments to really give importance to the long term. That would be a revolution. Uh, in some ways, it would be quite simple. I mean, there are easy things to do and hard things to do. Uh, uh, I'll give you just an example, an easy thing to do. Now, at, at least in the United States, we reward senior executives by uh, the price of the stock in the company. Even every quarter or every year or when they leave the company, they are rewarded according to the price of the stock, which gives them very bad incentives because they reduce uh, expenditures on research, for example, in order to increase, or they fire a lot of people in order to reduce their costs, because uh, that gives a short-term profit. But, uh, but we could easily say, uh, we will reward you uh, by the value of our stock five years after you go. So you have to do, before you leave, you have to make sure that you left the company in a situation so that five years from now it's going to be successful. Well, since you are able to edit out all the stuff you don't like, I can speak honestly. <clears throat> I don't expect that we're going to avoid collapse. Uh, I'm not sure what it, what it will look like. I mean, and. Uh, so I, mean, I, I, I simply don't know. I, can, I have many different scenarios, but, but, and actually we don't know. It's not, it's not knowable. I mean, uh, some huge volcano could blow up tomorrow in Indonesia, which uh, reduces the agricultural output of the planet by uh, 40 or 50 percent for five years. How do we know that could happen? It, it has happened several times in the past. So usually speaking, something which happened in the past could happen again, generally. So that could happen, or or, or epidemics. I mean, I don't know what it, what it will be, but uh, but in one way or another, we are so far globally, we are so far above the population and the consumption levels which can be supported by this planet that I know in one way or another it's going to come back down. So I don't hope to avoid that. Uh, I hope that it can occur in a, a, a civil way, I, I, and I mean civil in a, in a special way, I, peaceful. Peace doesn't mean uh, that everybody's happy, but it means that conflict isn't solved through violence, through, through force, uh, but rather in other ways, and so uh, that's what I hope for. Uh, that we can, I mean, the planet can support something like a billion people, maybe two billion, depending on how much liberty and how much material consumption you want to, to have. If you want more liberty and more consumption, you have to have fewer people. And conversely, you can have more people I mean, we could even have eight or nine billion, probably, if we have a very strong dictatorship, which is smart. It's, unfortunately, you never have smart dictatorships. They're always stupid. So, but if you had a smart dictatorship and a low standard of living, you can have it. But, but we want to have freedom and we want to have a high sentence, so we're going to have a billion people. And we're now at seven, so we have to get back down. I hope that this can be slow, relatively slow, and that it can be done in a way which is relatively equal, uh, you know, so that people share uh, the experience and you don't have a few rich, you know, trying to force everybody else to, to deal with it. So those are my hopes. I mean, these are pretty pessimistic hopes, you know, but I mean, that's, that's what lies ahead. And uh, within that hope, um, do we need a revolution to, to 
to, to come to peace? And if we need a revolution, what kind of revolution do we need? So a key issue here is the speed of the decline. We hope for a slow decline because that gives you time to adjust. If we had a volcano explosion, that's rapid. Suddenly, overnight, agricultural production went down by 40 or 50 percent, just like that. Uh, the globe can't peacefully adjust to such a shift like that. Uh, depletion of cheap energy is a slow process. You know, there will still be oil 100 years from now, but it'd be much more expensive. We have a chance to adjust to that in a more or less a peaceful way. So a, a key question is, what is the force that we're trying to adjust to? And if we know the speed, then that tells us something about the kind of revolution we need. You know, of course, it comes to question, what do you mean by revolution? Do you mean, uh, revolution uh, generally means uh, a drastic shift in structure. So there's political revolutions. You shift from uh, a king to a communist dictatorship, as happened in Russia back in 1920. That was a revolution. Uh, or there are psychological revolutions. Uh, one guy came up to me this morning and said, uh, I, I just quit smoking. And, you know, and he's very excited about that, which, which he should be. That's, for him, a, a revolution. Uh, so it's a question, what, what kind of revolutions are you mean? Well, we need them at both levels. We need personal revolutions. We need people to reimagine a lifestyle which uh, requires much less energy and material. You even can do that you know, in a place like uh, the Netherlands. Actually, the Netherlands is a, a great example of efficiency. I mean, compared with the Americans, uh, the, the typical city liver and person who lives in the city in Netherlands you know, uses much less energy and materials than the typical person living in a city in, uh, in the United States. Uh, but you could do much better uh, at, at the personal level. And then at the national level and the international level, you need these other kind of revolutions. I mean, it will be a big revolution to bring companies and governments to really give importance to the long term. That would be a revolution. Uh, in some ways, it would be quite simple. I mean, there are easy things to do and hard things to do. Uh, I, I give you just an example, an easy thing to do. Now, at, at least in the United States, we reward senior executives by uh, the price of the stock in the company. Even every quarter or every year or when they leave the company, they are rewarded according to the price of the stock which gives them very bad incentives because they reduce uh, expenditures on research, for example, in order to increase, or they fire a lot of people in order to reduce their costs, because uh, that gives a short-term profit. But, uh, but we could easily say, uh, we will reward you uh, by the value of our stock five years after you go. So you have to do, before you leave, you have to make sure that you left the company in a situation so that five years from now it's going to be successful. See, that doesn't require a new national law. Uh, it doesn't require a new consciousness. It's a fairly, quite a simple administrative change. You could do that, but it would be revolutionary in what it would cause, uh, the incentives it would cause. And then at the other extreme, you have, uh, you know, uh, some problems like, um, to deal with complexity, you split things up into specialties. So in your parliament, you have the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Energy, Ministry of Transport, et cetera. We all know that a decision made in one ministry has enormous consequences for the other ministries. By and large, this person makes those decisions without asking those people. And rather, they should do it together. But it's hard to do it together if you 
under the current circuit. So that would be a real revolution to start getting it so that a, a minister of, let's say, agriculture would do something which actually makes the farming situation seem worse in the short term, but means five years from now you have less energy requirement or less environmental damage or something like that. That would be a, a hard revolution. We, we need all of those uh, kinds of things.